So just before we start, how much time do you, do you want to build in any time at the end for questions? Yeah, that would be great. And kind of so talking about next steps. How much time do you think? Probably, you know, five minutes because okay. I think people will be asking questions throughout and then kind of lead them into what the next part of the series will be. Okay. Awesome. That'll be great. Okay. All right. So here we go. All right. Good afternoon. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Kristen Brooks, Executive Director with the Riverside County Office of Education, here also with Dr. Seema Cuddy from the same. And we are happy to welcome Dr. Katie Novak here with us today to start part one of our four-part webinar series on UDL. Um, and as promised, we are not going to do any talking. We are passing it right over to Katie. Um, so here we go. Just very excited for you all to engage. And as you know, this is being recorded and archived. Uh, please use the chat feature of the Zoom link, uh, if you can see that at the bottom, um, and we'll be able to engage back and forth in that way, and, and Katie will lead us through. So passing off to Katie. Hello, everybody. Happy Thursday. We're coming into a long weekend here in New England, so it's all good. And I'm so excited to be leading alongside you here, your journey into really understanding what it takes to build uh, a strategic system that supports universal design for learning for every single learner. And so in this first webinar, we're gonna unpack, you know, this concept of how do we build a system that's built on this foundation of UDL, and then do some big picture conversations of why UDL is just so critical for all learners. And then in the next couple of webinars, we're gonna dive really deeply into the different principles of UDL and what that might look like in practice. Um, the way that we're going to build this is we're going to have a webinar today. I will follow up with a bunch of resources that kind of unpack the different uh, ideas and concepts that I bring forward today. Um, as is UDL, you'll have plenty of options and choices to dive in. And then there'll be an opportunity as well to kind of share your thinking, ask me some questions, get some advice on, on maybe your strategic plans um, or your professional development ideas. And we'll kind of keep almost like a graduate course going um, to have a, a, a two-way communication and some feedback loops to make this a really engaging experience for you. And so you also have many options to be, uh, to, to actually take action, you know, on your plans. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen here for a second. I am going to lose the ability to see you, but I will stop periodically to take questions. And so let's see. How do I, there we go, I'm gonna blow this up. So what we're really gonna focus on here is how do you enable the ability to sustain successful implementation of UDL? You know, so a lot of the times what ends up happening when you're looking at a classroom or a school or a district or a county is, you know, people hear about UDL, it's exciting. You know, everybody went into education because they believed at some point that everybody was capable of learning. It was kind of like the draw. There was a teacher that saw more in us than we saw in ourselves. And it made us want to be a part of this work for this whole entire crazy, crazy adventure called life. And we chose teaching for a reason and maybe teaching chose us, but it was because we believe in the power of learning. And in some way we've really moved away from that. We don't talk a lot about what do we have to do to make sure every student learns. You know, we talk about what curriculum we're going to buy and what assessment we're going to purchase. And, you know, we have all this talk about scope and sequence, but we don't spend enough time talking about what are the barriers that prevent every kid from learning. And we really have to look back at the system and, and, and talk about why this work is so important. And so I want to start and ground you with a story of my own family and why this work is so important to me. Um, and it's not just that I'm talking about my daughter, but every single child we have is somebody's baby. And when I think about going into a system to inspire educators, to empower administrators, it's all about the fact that everybody's babies come to school and they deserve the best opportunities to be successful. They come as they are. We welcome them as they are. And for so long, we've created schools that everything that we do is in one size fits all. We expected to come in to comply and then to just receive the information that we're giving them. And it's really frustrating in a lot of ways when that doesn't work. You know, you hear educators kind of worldwide being really frustrated about like, why isn't this working? And what's really interesting is, you know, 
a variability is the rule. It's not the exception. And of course it's not working when we're asking everybody to do things in the same way. And so um, on the left-hand side of your screen, you see my um, beautiful, amazing family. That's my husband, Lon, and I have four kids. Um, the oldest, Torin, who's right next to my husband. I have twins, Aylan and Brecken. Uh, they're the bottom two. Um, and then Bowden, he's only three. And I want to tell you a story, however, about my daughter, Aylan, who's just sitting there with her signature smile. She's like my mini me. And Aylin is literally one of my favorite human beings in the entire universe. She is just a force to be reckoned with. There's so much spirit. There's so much compassion. Um, so she has her little smirk there in the picture. But one thing about Aylin is she is like was born ready to fight for the underdog. She was born with this sense of like equity and justice. And she loves like animals and, um, you know, people and babies. So the middle picture is this great, great story. She's outside playing. She finds this little baby rodent. And there was like a little tiny gardener snake that she also saw outside, nowhere near each other. But she's like, we can't, we can't leave this, this, this thing out. Now, at first we thought it was a mouse. So that's her holding this, this thing, right? And so we're like really trying to figure out what it is. Like I'm Googling baby squirrel, baby chipmunk, baby mouse, baby mole, baby woodchuck. We cannot figure out what on earth this rodent is. So as you're looking at it, you know, you can all take some guesses. I end up taking it to the high school science department because I'm like, I, I want to give it back to its mother, but I don't even know like where to look for a nest. Like anyway, it's a bunny. It's a baby bunny. And um, as you can see, it's so where, you know, she's feeding it with a paintbrush and goat's milk. But like when she sees anything or anybody suffering, like she is going to run over and she is going to save it. Um, the squirrel, this is an amazing story. Again, this child's only seven years old and we're going for a walk on a Saturday and a squirrel was hit by a car. Uh, we did not see the squirrel get hit by a car um, but it was it was bleeding and there was uh, there were flies in its mouth and it was obviously suffering and uh, I said uh, oh my gosh she's like mom look we have to do something I said oh my gosh honey that's it's so terrible this is just so so terrible there is nothing that I can do there is nothing I can do baby that squirrel's gonna die and she's like well if you don't do something I will so she turns to her twin brother Brecken who you see in that picture is standing behind her with no shirt on and says give me your shirt so he takes off his clothes um, and she goes into the street and she picks up the squirrel very, very carefully. And it's, it's clearly suffering and she wraps it up and she's like, if none of you are going to do anything, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to hold it until he dies. And she pets its head and, and the squirrel, like, it was like this beautiful moment where like, it just found so much peace in her arms. And as soon as she picked it up, the breathing slowed, you know, he closed his eyes and he... He, he died. And so like this kid could teach anyone about what it means to be compassionate, about what it means to be empathetic, about what it means to be a friend. Um, that is her twin brother, the bookend, and that's their, one of their best friend, James. And James has fragile X syndrome and um, he's almost completely nonverbal and obviously, you know, significantly um, developmentally delayed cognitively. And uh, they are just the three best of friends. And the really cool thing about uh, this story here is that, you know, Aylin, you know, from the first time she met him, she was like a warrior for James. And so um, when he was in first grade, when he gets really excited, he, he flaps his hands a little bit. And so he was running outside doing tag and he was flapping his hands and a bunch of little girls went up to him and said, why do you always do that with your hands? And Aylin sees this across the playground and she comes like busting across. And I hear this from a teacher who's my colleague. And she said, hey, ladies, if you're going to mess with someone, you're going to have to mess with me. And this is just like a little, a little ball of fire. Now I'll tell you something else about my daughter, Aylin, which is that she has severe, severe combined type ADHD. And for all the amazing strengths and beauty and fire she brings into this world, she can also be really impulsive and dangerous and violent. And those are ways that you could describe her, but that's not her. You know, she's just Aylin and she brings all these amazing strengths to the classroom. And she also brings these amazing areas that she needs to work on. And so what's really beautiful about this picture to me is that Brecken is significantly, significantly above grade level. And James is significantly below grade level. And Aylin exhibits behaviors that most classroom teachers will never, ever want to see. But the three of them are in the same class together all day, 
every day and they are challenged and they are supported equally because of universal design for learning. And in most places in this world, they would be separated. And they would be separated because there would be a belief that Brecken deserves more, that he deserves better, and that James can't do it, and that Aylin doesn't belong there because she can't behave. And, and what I will tell you is I will fight this fight until every parent of all of these kids gets to see that they belong together, that in this world, we all belong together. And when you separate them, what you're saying is that James and Aylin have nothing to offer Brecken, and they do. They all have equal, amazing things to offer each other. And so when I show people this picture, I say, okay, so this is a picture that was taken when they were in first grade. And maybe they're together in first grade, but people can never see them together in fifth grade, in eighth grade. What are we gonna do when it's algebra? What are we gonna do in, in 12th grade history? In a system that works for everyone, in a system that is universally designed, these kids will be educated together until they graduate high school. Because you know what? We live in the world together. And so the big, big takeaway that I want anyone to learn about UDL know is that, that our students are not disabled and our students are not broken. When students aren't learning, our systems are broken. And that really is where UDL comes in. This is not about band-aiding our system or about you know, reacting when kids don't learn. This is deconstructing a system that we have created that only favored kids who were compliant and who came to you on grade level. And that is not the reality of variability. And that is not the reason that I became an educator. And you know, the, the joke that I always make when people talk about like, you know, I want kids to be able to do this. I said, you know, pediatricians don't become doctors, so they only can do well visits. And, you know, saying that we're an educator and, you know, we only want to teach kids who are, you know, at second grade level and who behave is like when someone calls and says, my kid's sick, you're like, I don't do sick. You know, I, I only do well visits. And, and the power and the beauty of being an educator is that we have the power to design something that works for every single student. And we do that by creating a system, by creating a multi-tiered system of support that is built on a foundation of universal design for learning. And the system becomes critically important to how we're going to scale these practices. So I wanna unpack this visual here for, for you a minute, because I know in California, UDL is a really critical foundation of your MTSS system. And so on the bottom, there are six dates, and I'm gonna walk you through them really quickly. And you can just glance at them real quick, and you can start thinking about what are some of the big federal legislation pushes that happened in each of those different years? And how did that impact the way that we do school, I guess you could say? So in 1990, that was the every, uh, I'm sorry, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Those were 1990. And that is the beginning of inclusion if you look back historically. Um, because what happened in 1990 is we had to start reporting inclusion rates. So suddenly it was really important to try to get all students in the least restrictive environment available to them. And when you look at any continuum of services for special education, for example, the least restrictive environment is always going to be the general education classroom with their peers. And so in 1990, schools and districts had to actually start looking towards creating more equitable systems where what we did in that general education classroom allowed more students to be there. And so three different uh, initiatives came out of that. The first is co-teaching um, because what happened really quickly is we started saying well, let's push in some of these programs and that was a beautiful step forward for equity. The next thing was differentiated instruction. Carol Tomlinson was an instructor who worked with a lot of gifted students and suddenly there was this effort to provide all students with education together and it was like okay so we have to try to figure out what each of these kids needs and give them different things in the classroom. And then the third is UDL which we're going to spend a lot more time on today but UDL is very different from differentiated instruction which we'll dive into a little bit more. So for 12 years, everyone's reporting these inclusion rates and everybody's really excited about the progress because what we're doing is we're creating an environment that works for more kids. There's more kids like Aylin and Brecken and James that are being educated together for at least part of the school day. And that is a beautiful step forward. Um, and then in 2002, we had no child left behind because the question was, well, how's it going? How's inclusion going for everyone? And there are like crickets because nobody knows how inclusion is going because there was no requirement to report any subgroup data until No Child Left Behind. So 
if 1990 is the beginning of inclusion, 2002 is the beginning of our obsession with standardized testing. Because there were two things that came out of No Child Left Behind. Transparency was the first and accountability is the second. Transparency was you have to tell us how every subgroup of students is doing. Your English language learners, your economically disadvantaged, your students of color. Okay? You have to let us know how every group is doing in comparison to all students. And if those groups are not doing as well and they are not making growth like their peers, there will be consequences, also known as accountability measures. So for two years, we start reporting the subgroup data and everybody knows what happens. There are achievement gaps like nobody had ever expected. And we started naming them things like a negotiated curriculum or curricular chaos and all of this happens. And so what do we do in 2004? We say, we have to do something, we have to respond. So in 2004, the US federal government coined this, this framework called RTI or response to intervention. And the idea of RTI was that we still believe strongly in inclusion and the least restrictive environment, which means all students get tier one support in the least restrictive environment available to them. But then some students need more. And the federal legislation actually says you must supplement and not supplant. So the intent of RTI was never to reverse inclusion rates, but that's exactly what happened, is once we started worrying about, let's say you have a kiddos in seventh grade and, and a couple of them are reading at a second grade level, you say, oh my gosh, we have to give them some services. And then we, we start calling them tier two students and we pull them out of their ELA class and we put them in a small group reading. What we did is we undid many, many years of progress of inclusion. And so the idea behind RTI was all students get tier one, and then it's a really flexible movement up and down. When you need more, you get more. When you don't need it anymore, you don't need it anymore. And this kind of goes up and down. It wasn't effective. RTI failed to yield any results in closing that achievement gap. And it was not because RTI was not a great idea. We, of course, should respond with intervention when kids are struggling. And we have data that suggests that there are significant gaps. The issue was is that the system wasn't built for RTI to be successful. So in 2009, we transitioned from talking about RTI at the federal level to talking about this concept of a multi-tiered system of support. MTSS actually builds on to RTI. So if you look at that little schoolhouse in the middle, that was RTI that just stood by itself. Imagine it in like this vast wilderness and there's nothing around it. And then we started stepping back and we said, what do we need in order for that schoolhouse to actually work? What do we need to make tier one really comprehensive so all students can access it? And the first answer to that question was, we need to make sure that all students have equitable access and universal design for learning. So starting in 2009, there was like this renewal, this focus on saying, first of all, tier one has to be stronger. We will never intervention our way out of really strong tier one support. And so if you look at that graphic, the two founding frameworks of MTSS are equitable access and universal design for learning. Now, the definition of equitable access, you can learn it by just taking those two things and taking them apart, right? So access means you get a seat in the classroom, okay, that's access. So if I am a third grade teacher, if I am an eighth grade teacher, if I am an 11th grade science teacher, okay, if you get a seat in my classroom, then you have access to it. Equity means you get that seat in my classroom regardless of your race, your economic status, your English learner status, whether or not you have a disability, gender identity, religion, homelessness, right? So we look at all of these different protective classes and we said every single student should have equitable access to a tier one classroom, which means if I'm a seventh grade teacher, I have to create a system that it is the least restrictive environment for every single child. To do that, I have to implement the principles of universal design for learning. And that is not just academic. And so it's really important that we start to realize that UDL is about how do you design a learning environment that works for everyone. And what we're very aware of now is that it's not just academic. It's also behavioral and it's also social emotional. So my classroom, my tier one classroom, has to remove the barriers to academics. It has to remove the barriers that prevent kids from being able to behave and understand expectations. And it also has to remove the barriers for social emotional dysregulation. And so to do that, we're gonna step outside again and we're gonna look at drivers. 
And these drivers come from implementation science, which is out of the University of North Carolina. And they basically say, if you want to create a system that is built on UDL and equitable access, first of all, you have to have competency drivers. And these include, and this is where you come in in such an important way at the, the county office, is teacher professional development, teacher coaching, um, educator evaluation, teacher onboarding, mentoring, professional learning communities, instructional rounds. We have to build competence. If we don't invest in teachers, we don't invest in kids. And so this concept of like, we can't just turn around and say we're universally designing our system without really focusing first from the outside in. And so a lot of systems just want to go in and it's like, boom, okay, I want all kids pushed into tier one. And then that classroom becomes so wildly restrictive for so many kids because they can't access and engage behaviorally, academically, or socially, emotionally. And so I want to focus on competency drivers. I also want to focus on leadership drivers because really strong leaders not only build their own competency, they build the competency of their colleagues. And then they also have to think about really important things like resource allocation and they're in charge of scheduling. So if you look at a lot of the educator rubrics for, um, for administrators, school and district building level administrators, um, you start thinking about, do they have the schedule that allows for universal design for learning and tiered support, which means if every kid's in my class for seventh grade English, is there a schedule that allows them to also get reading? Okay, that's the intent of targeted tier two support. Or maybe the, the, the tier two support is being pushed into my classroom during a workshop model. Maybe I'm co-teaching, but all of those things really have to be thought of in a more strategic way. And that's where the implementation driver comes in. Do we have a standards-based scope and sequence for curriculum that we can universally design? Do we have fidelity checks and feedback loops? So we're constantly talking to teachers and talking to administrators. And so what we learned in 2009 is that MTSS is wildly effective. That when we work from the outside in, what we realize is the reasons why kids aren't learning are not because of the kids. The kids come to us as they are. The reason kids aren't learning is because we're not universally designing our system and many kids don't have equitable access to the best teaching and learning they can access academically, behaviorally, and socially, emotionally. And so to do this, we have to remove the barriers of the system by taking away the fact that teachers don't know how to implement UDL or to take away the barrier that they don't have the schedule where kids can get tier two support. Or we take away the barrier they don't have the curriculum or the resources in their hands to be able to even universally design them because it's not clear what the standards are. And so MTSS in 2009 started shifting the system and started closing those gaps. And so in 2012, uh, Race to the Top came out and that's when we really started focusing on how do we increase the expectations of tier one. So the Common Core Standards came out of that. And the Common Core Standards explicitly endorse universal design for learning. And they say that all students, every student has access to grade level standards in the least restrictive environment available to them. So it basically like renewed this sense of inclusion we started with in 1990. But it also said there has to be accountability. And so it kind of brought 1990 and 2002 together. And this morphed into the Every Student Succeeds Act in 2015, which basically only endorsed a single framework, and that's universal design for learning for equitable access. And they don't ever use the term RTI. They don't ever use the term differentiated instruction. Okay? They say numerous times that all teaching, learning, behavior, professional development needs to be universally designed through every single state and district and school creating a multi-tiered system of support, which means we have to start thinking strategically about making long-term plans from the outside in. So I'm gonna show you one slide and then I'm gonna stop this and ask and answer questions, but to just show you what this looks like in one, one small area, because I know a focus of this webinar was like, how do we build this system? And there's things that you can do tomorrow and there's things you have to really think strategically about. If it's a barrier, how am I gonna eliminate it in the long term? And so a lot of strategy thinking is you're looking five years out. What, is all, what are all the barriers we wanna eliminate within these next five years? So when I first came to my district in Groton Dunstable Regional School District in Massachusetts, um, the first thing I did was conduct a needs assessment. And so the new administrative team, we basically were like, okay, so we see what the student data is. We see where kids aren't learning yet. We want to talk to teachers. Why aren't they learning yet? And a number of things came up, which are actually real barriers is like, 
we don't have any universal screening tools, you know, we don't have really data, so we're not quite sure where kids are struggling, uh, we don't have enough professional development time, you know, no one's ever taught us how to meet the needs of all these kids in a classroom. You know, this wasn't about getting extra people, it was about competency and leadership and implementation drivers. And so what we realized is that we only had 18 and a half hours an entire year in our schedule for professional development. The average for our district accountability review and the best in class districts, those are just ways that we compare ourselves to districts like us in our county. Their average was 64.7 hours a year. So already we're so behind, right? And so if we know that the big driver is building competency, we were like, how are we gonna build competency? And this is just one, one aspect of our plan. Um, but it's just to show you how robust this system is to be able to make sure that my teachers have enough competency to be able to actually incorporate and implement these uh, initiatives. So we realize we don't have enough time for professional development. That is a barrier. We're going to eliminate it. Now, some things we did in the short term is we immediately started changing faculty meetings into professional development. Um, we started uh, pushing into a lot of uh, classrooms to do model lessons. So if I would go in and teach a lesson and a bunch of teachers could observe me, we did professional development that way. We got creative about book clubs and Twitter chats, but all of those things were, were a band-aid because they weren't built into our system. So year two, we said, okay, we have to make an argument why PD is so important. And so we spent an entire year going through like peer reviewed research, finding the districts that outperformed us, going to try to figure out what were they doing. Um, I pulled all of, again, those dark calendars are just the ones that the state wants us to review ourselves against. It's called the district um, review tool. And, um, but then we also basically started asking all our stakeholders, our teachers, our paraprofessionals, our parents to say, if we got more, um, more P PD, you know, do you think it makes sense to get it through half days, through full days? What are your concerns? Um, we realized that everybody wanted a half day on Friday. It was a very popular thing. You know, thousands of people answered. And so we said, okay, um, now if we had half days on Friday, what are the barriers? And people were like, well, there's, you know, if we decide to go away, that's great, but otherwise, where do my kids go? So we worked with community education to make sure that there would be a place that kids could go. Um, students on free and reduced lunch could obviously go there for no cost. We would make sure that lunch was there. Okay, so we have a plan, right? So year one, we're exploring, okay? That's the first step of implementation. Year two, we're planning, okay? Year three, we're like ready to go initial implementation. So we drafted a formal proposal with our administration and our teachers union, and we basically said, we have a way that we can meet the minimum time on learning, we also know parents support half days on Fridays. Here's all the research about how much of a gain you're going to get on this. And this is how we're going to align our, our teaching and learning. So you're going to know what we're going to be doing every single time we have professional development. We're going to send out a commercial. We're going to tell you what teachers are working on. We're going to ask you to look for evidence of that in student work. School committee loved it. They adopted it. Year four, 78 and a half hours designated a year for professional development. And we do, we send out a commercial to the parents. Um, we make sure that we let everybody know what the essential questions are, what the outcomes are, what kind of options teachers are gonna have. Um, we always tie these things to educator evaluation. And so the focus of 70 and eight and a half hours a year are how do we create a universally designed system that works for all students. So one thing I'm really proud of in our district is because of all this work, and we've done this in many ways with data, with pedagogy, with, with curriculum, um, what we have found is that in our, in our state, there's 1,500 elementary schools and only 52 schools in the entire state were highlighted as being um, uh, exceeding, uh, exceeding, significantly exceeding benchmark targets, right? So the state tells you you need to improve, okay? Every single cohort, every single grade, every single subgroup in our district exceeded expectations in both of our elementary schools from creating this model. So this concept of like, what does it take? It's I think both scary and amazing and powerful to realize the scope of investment that we need to put in, but also what you get out of that investment is 10 times more than what you will ever put into it. Because by being really thoughtful about the fact that like, we are not gonna allow this not to happen in our district and we're going to make it so the teachers can't fail.
And if the teachers can't fail, the kids can't fail. And that is what we are seeing. And so this concept of how do we create a system that works for all students is we need the best of inclusion and we need the best of those leadership drivers, which is competency, leadership, and implementation to build a system from the outside in. So I'm going to take a second here and stop because I know I gave you a lot of information and um, just to see, okay, so someone just said, where does special education fall within the MTSS system? Now, um, I actually created the MTSS blueprint for the state of Massachusetts. Um, I did work in partnership with the Office of Special Education and special education is everywhere. So um, there is not a spot in MTSS for special education because, for example, in UDL-topia, okay, um, if, if UDL-topia existed, right, and I was able to eliminate all the, the different um, barriers in my classroom, um, a student could be in my classroom all day in tier one and have all their needs met. Okay, because I would allow for those accommodations just to be a part of whatever I was doing with any student. So you could have a student with special education and because I'm universally designing my classroom and allowing all this access to exemplars and graphic organizers and quiet space and revision and small group instruction, I could have a special education student who lives in tier one. Um, I might have a special education student who um, you know, lives in tier one and then also needs to get um, some math intervention. Um, we changed our schedule in our system. And so every single day we have something called the win block. W-I-N stands for what I need. And in the win block, what we do is we make sure that um, all students get their intervention, anything on the grid during that time. And so that's like the multi-tiered system. Um, but also you wouldn't need a special education IEP in order to get tier two services because you might only need them for like three weeks or, or you know, maybe six weeks. So for example, I could have a student who, um, is a special education student sitting in tier one. I could have a student who's a general education student sitting in tier one. Um, they end up struggling a lot with a geometry concept. So every six weeks when we change wind blocks, a teacher pulls them for tier two intervention um, for six weeks. They're in it for six weeks. We have data that shows they've been able to, to uh, close that gap, they go back into tier one. And you could also be in all three tiers at once. So maybe your tier one ELA, there's like a math related disability. So you get tier two math intervention during the win block. And then maybe you have to meet one-on-one -on -one with an adjustment counselor for social emotional learning. Um, and that would be tier three. But when we created it, we were really, really focused on this concept of, of how we um, make the arrows so it's flexible. So if we, if I went back to that visual and showed you, and I will send you all the documents on this. So again, I'll present first and then I'll follow up with a PDF that's like, you want to know more about this slide? Choose some of these resources. You want to know more about this slide? So you'll have all of those things and we can go back and forth and interact. Um, but this concept of, you know, in theory, I agree with you. In a system that is perfectly universally designed, you would not need an IEP because every kid would get what they needed regardless of legal recourse. Okay, now we're talking about perfect world. The reality is, is it's not a perfect world yet. And so we need to make sure that students are protected and they do get the things that they need. Um, but like, you know, David Rose, who's the father of UDL, always said that an IEP is really a band-aid for a broken system. That a system shouldn't need a document to give a kid what they need. They should just know every student's strengths and every student's area. Um, but, but until we can assure that every kid gets that, um, we do need these services. So, you know, in theory, it would be whoever needs them gets them. Um, the other big thing we have right now that's working against us is there are certain kids who they will not get the accountabilities on the standardized test unless it is written into an IEP. Again, that is a very broken assessment system, um, but ideally the UDL National Task Force is really fighting for a universally designed test, which means that you don't need an IEP to get these accommodations. And then that would also you know, provide a little bit more inclusiveness. Um, Somebody else, Rachel um, or Rochelle, um, wrote, what did your PD scope and sequence entail? And that basically started with what it is, what is it that kids actually have to know and be able to do? If you don't have a PD scope and sequence, you're already behind the eight ball with UDL because UDL is a standards-based curriculum design. 
every UDL unit starts with a very, very clear goal. Okay, the, one of the taglines that we use is firm goals, flexible means. And so if we believe in firm goals, what we did is we basically sat with teachers, we handed out a copy of the standards, like handed out highlighters, and we're like, actually read through them all, read through the whole document. Don't just read through the standards, read through the introduction, read the subheadings, read the settings, we can jigsaw. Know what your standards are and then decide what are the highest levels of priority. Okay, what is the minimum that every kid coming out of second grade is gonna know and be able to do? And then figure out how much time you're gonna spend to get them there. So the first thing we did in the PD scope and sequence is we basically said, okay, so if we know the need to do this, we kind of charted it out. And what I don't want is like an English teacher being like, well, I have to spend three weeks on, on the Oxford comma because it's in the standard. No, I need kids to like think critically about information and text, whether it's a video or audio. You know, I need them to cite evidence from that and use it for their own arguments and narratives. You know, I need I had these big, big picture standards. Once we had the big picture standards, we came up with essential questions. Um, and then once we did that, we came up with universally designed common assessments. From there, we empowered teachers to do whatever those kids needed to get them from A to B. Okay, so start with a diagnostic. What do they already know? What do they need to know? Okay, and then provide options and choices so every single student can be challenged and supported so that when you give a common assessment, whether it's a formative or a, a summative, you'll be able to say, I got students here. If you did, awesome. If you didn't, we're going to give them a double dose and a win block. Okay, we're going to look at the data. We're going to do things differently. We're going to provide different options and choices. Um, and so, again, that's a part of what is built in. And so, you know, if you're thinking about UDL, what you end up a lot of times is like, we're going to read Charlotte's Web. And when they read Charlotte's Web, they can choose to do, a, they can choose to make a poster. They can choose to make Wilbur out of clay. They can choose to do a book trailer. They can choose to dress up as a character. And it's like, why are you doing any of that? It's not standards-based. Like, Charlotte's Web is not a standard. Like, you have, you have no outcome. And so that's, that's not UDL, okay? All that is is kids doing a bunch of different things and probably learning very little. Um, UDL is saying to kids, okay, at the end of these three weeks, all of you are going to know how to create a character, and you're going to know how to do that through really effective dialogue and through actions and thoughts and feelings. And we're going to look at some of the most amazing characters of all time in literature in really short mini lessons. And then you're going to choose characters that you care about to explore and to try to figure out how were they created? Like, why do we love these movie characters? Why do we love these video game characters? What about them? And how can we steal that craft of what we love to create our own characters? And that's the goal. You know, and then you start to realize there's so many options and choices there. So that was just all a part of like the big picture. So I think a lot of people want to jump right in, like, like let's throw on our bathing suits and just jump in and let's go to tier one and let's make it universally designed. But when you look from the outside in, you'll realize that, that we can't make that happen in a vacuum, is we have to have everything in place that when we require it, we can support it. And if we can't support it, it's not the teachers that are broken, it is the system that is broken because it's not allowing teachers to be effective. If we want teachers to be effective, we have to provide them with professional development and the resources they need and the support that they need and the data that they need to make really, really good decisions to empower kids to personalize their learning towards standards because accountability is still a part of this. And so um, if there's any other questions, um, please just type them in that chat box. And if there are not, I'm going to dive in a little bit more into this, like what is this UDL that we're trying to build? So I'll just give you a couple more seconds to see. And again, I'm happy to, I'll, I'll share a lot of different documents with you, um, some of the work that we did. Um, so you can kind of see like what would be the best place, like what's the biggest barrier that you all face? And that's what you want to start saying, okay, if this is the biggest barrier we face, and in three years we want to make this go away, what do we have to start doing now to make that go away? Okay, so I'm going to go back to share my screen. And, okay, so we're diving into UDL, and this is one of my favorite um, analogies ever, and I use it all the time, but I just think it's so, so relevant and such a great way to explain UDL to people who have never heard of it. Um, yesterday, I was, I was telling Seema at the beginning, and Kristen, I had the best experience yesterday to do a keynote for, um, for NASA. It was the NASA annual meeting for their science activation team. And I'm in a room with all these brilliant, amazing scientists. And I said the ice cream truck analogy. And they're like, oh my gosh, I get it. Like, that makes so much sense. 
So again, what we want to do is we want students to make their own choices. We want students to personalize their learning. There is no way that I know enough about 30 kids to create something for them without me making 30 different things. Okay. I don't want to make 30 different things. I just want to have a buffet of 30 different things and then say to them, I believe in you. Like life is going to give you a lot of options. And I believe that you can make great choices, even if you don't make them the first time, but that's totally cool with me. We'll learn together. And so if you want to really structure student choice, the first thing you have to do is provide options. And so this looks really good because there are so many options. And so somebody could be like, oh, I'll have the, you know, I'll have the ice cream sandwich or I'll have the snow cone or whatever it happens to be. Um, maybe a cold bottle of water. But the goal is clear, right? Ice cream truck has a goal. Make money selling cold stuff on hot days. Like that is their standard, right? And so um, the reason it works is because when guests come up, regardless of variability, I say to them, look, see what I have for options. Think about your needs self-assess, and then choose what's best for you. So some of you pick one thing, some of you pick another thing. Okay, that's amazing. Every day in the classroom, we literally have the same opportunity, okay? Because if I know kids need to know photosynthesis, okay, it's like I realize there's a lot of options. Like I could find some awesome new Zella articles where the students can personalize them at their own level. I might have some videos or just encourage older kids to go to discovery video and find their own. I have the textbooks already in front of me. I could have a small group and kind of explain it as I go. Those options exist. Now I need to know that they can respond to a text about photosynthesis, right? So I maybe say, okay, here's 10 questions you can answer. You can choose to type them or write them. You can work with a partner or on your own. I'm gonna do the most amazing sonnet of all time if you wanna help me. We're gonna add a little I'm a pentameter into this response. Okay, it's ego wild, right? People don't do that. What people do is they say, hi everyone, it's hot out. You're all gonna eat the drumstick, which has nuts and chocolate and all of these things. And then you have some kids that are like, ah, uh, hey, hi, I'm allergic to nuts. And we're like, you're picky, shush, go away. And I'm, I'm so totally being fresh on purpose here. Um, but then you have other people who are like, I just, I don't want that. I don't want it. Like, I'm happy to meet the goal. I have a bottle of water, I don't wanna eat that. And the difference between those two things are the difference between access and engagement, okay? If we provide things in one way, everyone has to read this article, everyone has to watch this video, everyone has to complete this lab, everyone has to do these 10 math problems. You have some kiddos, if we truly believe in inclusion and variability, you have some kiddos who are not gonna be able to access at that level, okay? They developmentally, cognitively, ling linguistically, they're just not there yet, okay? And, and so, it's not that they can't meet the goal because what you can see is everyone can meet the goal. Everyone can have a sip of water, everyone can, okay? But they can't all just guzzle down the drumstick, right? And so what we say is there's something wrong with that kid because I spent a ton of time making that ice cream and it was awesome. Like I shelled the peanuts I, and, and this argument that like it should have worked because I really care about it because I took a lot of time doesn't make sense in a world that values diversity and inclusion. Um, and then you have some students who are like, yeah, I have no lactose intolerant. I have no nut allergy. I don't, want it. I don't want it. And that's an engagement problem. So there's two reasons why our kids will not learn in a classroom, okay? The reason that classrooms are too restrictive for students, okay? Because again, what we're going for is the least restrictive environment available. The reason that it's too restrictive is because either the academics, the behavioral expectations, or the social emotional coping expectations are not accessible or they're not engaging, okay? And so what do we do, right? We have to start teaching kids how to make choices. And this is like one of my new favorite books. Um, um, Mike Anderson, he's this great, great teacher in, in New Hampshire. And he basically says, when you give students an option, you have to actually let them choose. And if you wanna teach them how to choose, you have to teach them what are the three pieces of making a choice? What are you interested in doing? What do you actually need to do? And logistically, what can you do? Okay, so I was an English teacher for 12 years. And so I'll give you a quick English example because this is what I would do in my classroom is I would say, okay, all of us are gonna try to figure out what is the best simile of all time. Okay, it's a very, very serious competition. Okay, the best simile of all time. And so what I want you to do is um, you can work alone or with a partner. You're gonna either go into a bunch of books over there of poetry and try to find one. Um, you can go on the computer, okay, and you can start researching them, or you can come over here with me, and I am just gonna, I'm just gonna to, to bask you with my brilliance of similes, and we're gonna make our own. Okay, so you can make your own. Okay, you have 15 minutes. 
And in 15 minutes, you have to submit 10 that you think are really amazing. Okay. And then we're going to vote on the best one. And all of us are going to write about the best one. Right. And so I'm going to let everybody actually choose, right? I'm going to let them do it. Even if it's disastrous. So I see two little lovies go off on their own and I can tell they're horsing around. They're not doing anything. Okay. I'm going to let them do it. I'm going to let them do nothing. Then it's going to come time for the review. Okay. 10 minutes. Okay. This is really micro failure for macro success. And I'm going to say, okay, so everyone, you spent a lot of time learning about similes and the different patterns and things. I'm going to give you a quick quiz. Okay. I'm going to do a quick diagnostic assessment here. I give you 15 minutes. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to analyze this poem. I want you to tell me what the similes are and which one's the most effective and why. Okay. If they didn't make the great choices to begin with, they're going to fail. They're not going to be able to answer it. When they don't answer, I say, no, that's no big deal. That's no big deal. This is an opportunity to make a better choice next time because this one doesn't count. What I just gave you doesn't count. But like when someone asks you to do something, think about like, I know you want to work with your friend and I know you want to go through that book, but like you need to get this done. I told you it was 15 minutes. And then, you know, you'll have some kids that are like, oh, I didn't get it done because there were only six iPads and I didn't get one. And I'm like, well, then choose the book. Like logistically, if there wasn't a computer, you have to be flexible, right? And so what UDL is, is if every single time we provide options, we provide choices, we have to allow students how to make choices. And what that means is they have to fail, okay? You have to fail in order to get it right. Okay. You have to fall off your bike before you learn not to turn too much to the right or to not turn too much to the left or don't be stagnant on your pedals. And in order to make really good choices, you have to make bad ones. And that's a part of what this, that book is about and a part of what UDL is about. Because when we say, how do you sustain, how do you sustain engagement? What we're really saying is first you get them interested. That's number one. Then you get them to sustain effort and persistence because that's what they need to do to meet the goal. And we also need them to create strategies strategically so logistically they can get there. But that requires kids becoming a part of their own learning. And what we know about students is there's this wide variability among them. And so you look at those two gentlemen on the left and they're like average guys, like mythical average guys, I guess. Um, and, and they actually have like a, a torso that's like, you know, kind of like their shoulders are kind of like the same. Now imagine if I look at those, the torso and you know, the shoulder and I say, okay, so um, I'm going to just look at like the two points that they're the closest to, which I think is going to be, let's see, I'm trying to find the two dots. Like, I guess they're both their weight. Okay. They have about the same weight. So I'm going to get their weights and I'm going to say, okay, one of them's like, you know, 190, one of them's, you know, 195. I'm going to give them the same suit. That's what differentiated instruction did. Okay, differentiated instruction was grouping students and giving those students what they need. Now, again, huge, huge step forward from the lack of inclusion and a great idea for intervention. So differentiated instruction and UDL can be married in a multi-tiered system, okay? But if I do that in tier one, okay, they will never get the opportunity to choose, to actually reflect and make choices. And if you look at the girl and her cognitive profile, she probably has a language-based learning disability. Okay, reading vocabulary, visual perception, very low. Okay, very, very low on that bell curve. But so much background knowledge, so much curiosity, so much interest. Okay, if I call this kid a tier two kid, and pull about her a, an amazing tier one classroom where she has options and choices of like reading and interacting with her peers and learning from her mistakes. And I just throw her in like a, an LLI, level literacy intervention classroom where she's reading like the same books over and over, following these scripts. I'm gonna lose that kid because my system is disabled. And so this idea of saying everyone gets tier one that's universally designed, and then when data suggests you get something else, we do provide that. But we provide that for the most minimal amount of time possible so that kid can then be back in tier one. Um, and so UDL, in a nutshell, like really quick visual, is there are three principles to UDL, okay? And it's basically we provide multiple means of engagement, which are options for engagement. And when we provide options, we provide choices, multiple means of representation and multiple means of action and expression. And so what we're basically saying is first, we need to get kids engaged. That means we have to get them interested and we have to get them willing to work hard. We have to get them willing to fail, to take risks, to challenge themselves, to cope with those challenges. That is the essence of engagement, is expert learning. We want kids to learn how to learn. 
So the first thing we do is we make the goal really clear. It's like a heating system. I can go right up to my thermostat and I can say 72. So I love that question about the scope and sequence because you have to know what it is that students have to know or be able to do. Okay, that's the thermostat. And I basically say, this is the goal. This is why it's important. And you're gonna have all these options and choices to like make it meaningful for you. The next is they have to build comprehension in some way. They have to learn something. So that's like the what. And I think of that as like the burner, right? So when I put the 72 in my thermostat, it communicates with the burner. And then the burner all of a sudden is gonna comprehend that message. It has to receive it and comprehend it. So if I need students to know or be able to do something, they have to receive it. So the first thing is that they have to be able to access it. So like visually or auditorily, but also they have to know the right vocab. They have to have the right background knowledge. They have to know how to generalize it and transfer it in like a meaningful way onto a standardized measure. And a lot of people miss that about UDL um, because they're like, if you're giving them all these options and choices to read all these different texts, how are they going to take this high stakes test? You know, the smarter balance, the park. And it's, if I do my job in UDL, and the goal is that they'll be able to read grade level text and understand characterization, I am telling you right now, you can put any of my kids on a smarter balance test, and you can give them a narrative, and you can ask them about characterization, and they'll be able to answer it. Okay, even though we read about, we read into movies and we, you know, created our own characters and we acted it out, we, they know characterization. I know that, okay, because I have so much data to show that because we universally designed it. I also know they can read because I universally designed context clues. I also know they can write because I universally designed the way that we respond to text, right? I need them to generalize that and transfer it, okay? And that's how I know they have it. And if they have it, they'll use it. Um, and then lastly, that's the whole part is how are they going to use it? How do I have that output? And that's the blower. I don't know if the burner comprehended the message if hot air doesn't come out, right? And so that's what are they going to do with it? How do they express it? How do they get it out? So we engage them. We provide them opportunities to learn. And we provide them with opportunities to share what they know. So it's really like if you're looking at it as a really linear process, which it's not, it's like we engage them, we teach them, we assess them. <laughs> and, and we do that and it's all intertwined with options and choices. So in a nutshell, I want you to think of UDL as self-differentiation. First things first, it is a standards-based curriculum design. The goal of unit design has to be clear. So districts who already are doing like a UBD and understanding by design, they're like prime and ready to go into UDL because they're already starting with the standards and the essential questions. Now, UBD doesn't have to be universally designed because you might go standards, essential questions, now everyone's going to read this, now everyone's going to fill out this, now everyone's going to do this. But that backwards design is what UDL is all about. So we make the goal really clear, and then we basically say, okay, so there's stuff you have to know. You have to know this stuff in order to meet the goal. How are you going to learn it? What's interesting to you? What do you need? And then what logistically do we have? Okay, let's work together and figure it out. How are we going to learn this? What stuff do you need to learn it? So if I need kids to be able to write in response to a, a really complicated quadratic equation, I might say, okay, there's done problems. Okay, I have problems already done step by step if you want an exemplar. You can use your calculator. You'll free to, uh, feel free to use uh, a big whiteboard. Um, you can work with a partner. All those things is like what materials. I don't have to pass everything out to the same kid. I say, think about the goal. What do you wanna do? Balance that, what do you need? And then the last part is logistically what's available. Okay, and I'll fight to get it. If it's not available now, I'll fight to get it, but let's do the best we can with what we have. Next step, you have to show me what you know. Okay, so knowing that this is the goal, knowing you all have to solve a quadratic equation, okay, knowing that I know you all learned it, whether you watched Khan Academy, whether you worked in small groups, whether we played games, okay, I know that all of you can do it. So show me that you know it, you know? Here's 10 problems, choose one, show me everything you know about it. Tell me why it's right, tell me the problems that you know, are you know, multiple choice. I have a bunch of teachers who will say, choose one, tell me why it's right, but then prove why the other ones are wrong, but there's still good answers. Like where did the mistake get made where someone would pick that answer? Um, you know, does it need to be translated in another language? Does it, you need to have manipulatives. All of this comes together, it's driven by the student. And that's a really, really important thing to remember because we have to teach on the outside 
how teachers create an environment that empowers kids to do that in ways that they're coping in ways that they're behaving. So UDL marries itself really well with like PBIS systems or things like responsive classroom or open circle or restorative uh, practices because it's all about creating an environment where kids can make these choices and self-differentiate because they're very clear. The goal is we will all respect each other. The goal is when we're frustrated, we choose a really healthy way to, to deal with that before we go back to our work. And so what we're really trying to do in this successful system is we're trying to balance everything on the right with everything on the left. And everything on the left is what our little loveys bring to us, right? Every day, these beautiful children, my Aylin, my Brecken, sweet James, they come in and they bring their mood with them and they bring all the experiences they've had in life, whether it's trauma, you know, whether it's, um, you know, whatever these loves are dealing with. Okay. They bring their own background knowledge. They bring their own special strengths and weaknesses, you know, their temperament, their personality, they come as they are. And it is our job to teach them. They come as they are. They are not broken. We, on the other hand, have these amazing opportunities to balance that. We can allow each of these kids to set personalized goals. Okay, by saying, what's interesting to you? What do you need? Okay, what, what, what do we need to do together to beat this system? We can teach them about all the different ways they cope. Okay, if we want them to fail, we have to teach them to cope with failure. It's the gift of failure. How do we create a classroom where that's okay, where you can take risks? Okay, how do we give them feedback constantly in that review process? Choose, do, review. Okay, when we're reviewing, how can I help them by giving them feedback, by saying, you know what? You're so close. Next time, try this. Okay, how many supports do we have there? Do we have academic support, graphic organizers, exemplars, support providers, you know, check-in conferences, peer reviews? Do we have behavioral supports? Um, do we have social emotional supports? And then lastly, are we really clear about the nature of our instructions? And that goes back to the scope and sequence. What is it that students have to know and be able to do? And we have to be really clear with them about that. Get rid of all the crap that we put all around those goals and say, this is what you know. This is what you need to know. How are we going to get there together? And that right there is really the beauty of UDL. So in this last section here, I just wanted you to kind of take a second, and this is the last two minutes, is just this concept of like efficacy. What the, the driver here, the opportunity that you have in working with teachers and administrators is like we have to create an environment that teachers feel like they can do this, okay? And we do it the same exact way that teachers do it with kids, is we say to teachers, this is what you have to do. This is the goal, this is the standard. You have to create a classroom that works for all students, okay? And tell me what you know about it already. These are the different options you have to learn about how to do it, okay? This is what we offer as a county office. These are all the different supports we offer, you know, for coaching, for um, virtual professional development, for, you know, uh, in-person professional development. These are the materials that we'll provide to you. Here's some sample lessons, you know, we can do it, whatever it happens to be. And then how are you gonna know where they're at? Are you going to do lesson studies? Are you gonna observe classrooms? Are you gonna ask administrators to see teacher observations, okay? And so I wanted to give you an opportunity if you're in a room with someone to kind of chat, um, but I want to, again, just take, oops, stop the share here because we're coming at the end of our hour and really bringing this all together is we started thinking about how do we create a system that makes sure that there's no room for failure for kids and to do this, we have to support teachers to make sure there's no room for failure for them. And both of those things require us to make sure that all learners, teachers, students, administrators alike, have access, equitable access, to the teaching and learning that makes sure that they have the right methods, the right materials, and the right ways to express what they know so that they can get feedback, so they can cope, so the supports are available to them. So the last thing, I just wanna go back really quick to that slide and just ask you to think about teachers when you think about this slide. So right here, a successful system of support for teachers is the teachers come to us. 
their moods are with them. Like embrace them. They'll like they'll throw themselves in front of a bullet for a kid. Like you get to be in any mood you want to be. Okay. Things are hard. Things are frustrating. I get it. And the reason so many of them are so pissed is because they don't get any feedback about how to do it better. They don't have the right available support. The nature of what they're being asked to do isn't really clear. They're really struggling with how to cope with all of these different changes. And we don't allow them to personalize their professional development to turn the classroom into something really beautiful for them and the kids, because that's what in a learning environment really is. So I am like so thrilled to be a part of this journey to kind of help you navigate that, uh, that journey yourself. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll follow up right away to Seema with um, a, a PDF of resources about the different things I talked to you about today. Um, and then also an opportunity for you to be able to interact with me. Um, so if you have any questions, I can address them as I kind of design the next webinar or I can just respond to you personally. Um, so for the last minute here, are there any burning questions or any takeaways or anything you want to comment on before we tie this up? Kristen, Seema, do you have anything? You know, of course, just fantastic, right? Like you just your, your, and let me turn my camera on here. Just your presentation style is so engaging and just the way that you address the audience. I mean, trying to universally design from, a, from Zoom, you're doing a fantastic job. So we appreciate it and appreciate working with you so much. Um, and as people are sending in questions, I just want to remind folks that the next webinar is November 15th and then not again until December 6th. So we're going to take a break for Thanksgiving there. But so the next one is on the 15th. Um, back here with Katie, same time, same bat channel. Um, and we will be sending the link out for that. So, um, so I just really want to say thanks so much. I'm already energized and I'm getting messages throughout that folks are wanting to share the link once the recording is downloaded and, and people are on fire. So, um, so looking at, um, I'm sure you can see the chat too. People are just saying, thank you so much. Your passion is motivating. Quick thank you to making it accessible. Lots and lots of thanks coming through. Okay, awesome. Well, anyone, again, I'll, I'll send out that PDF. There'll be ways to contact me. And again, like, we, we can turn this. Like, we can turn this around. And, I, and I'm in a district and I've seen it happen. And I see, like, my colleagues coming back and realizing, like, I'm good at this. Like, a lot of teachers are feeling like I'm not good at it. And it's like, because we're not, we're not supporting them like we need to be supporting them. And they're like the most integral part of the whole system, you right. know? So like the having a county office that's like committed to doing this work to support the system that teachers are a part of will only, only benefit kids down the road. So I look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you so much. Thank really you so much, Katie. Thank okay, bye-bye. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you for being here.